<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome today. You have Rachel and Angelica here, and we are so excited to welcome Sonia Simeon to the podcast today. She's a writer and a wisdom guide, and we are so delighted to share in her wisdom and her stories on today's episode. So Sonia, we want to kick it off by asking you the first time that you ever felt connected to something bigger than yourself or connected to something on a spiritual level. Mm. That's such a good question. Yeah. What a great way to, to start off. Some, the first time. Wow. You know, the thing that comes to my mind is I always connect through very, you know, I have a lot of kapha energy to me. I have like, like a lot of that in my constitution as well, but it's, it always comes to food. When I was a little girl, um, you know, my grandparents, they lived in rural Michigan and they would often, you know, they had this huge garden and my grandmother, I have this very vivid memory of, um, they drove me to this secret place in the woods and we picked wild blueberries. Mm -hmm. And there was this feeling of it where it, it's, I still like, I love cooking. I am, I am, you know, for lack of a better word, a foodie, but Ayurveda helps it to become a lot more uh, focused. <laughs> And so that to me, food, nourishment, my body, you know, and doing it in a way that is, is very, very wholesome. That connects me to spirit in a way that, that, you know, I could say all of these different divine experiences I've had. And that one, I could say, I must have been five or six years old. But I remember so vividly the scene of my, my grandfather driving up into the secret part of the woods and, and they knew where to find the blueberries. And it was so special and it was just made me realize that there was something much greater that was guiding my family in that moment. You know, it's like the, just the quest to find the blueberries, <laughs> but it's a quest to find the body. I love that. And would you say that your grandparents had any impact on the journey that you're on today? Or do you just remember that as being really special and connected to nature and the abundance of the earth in that moment? Well, they, they weren't into Ayurveda, but you know, they were, they, they, uh, my grandfather had a greenhouse that, you know, they grew vegetables all winter. My grandmother can, they lived in a lake and they went fishing. Like we went ice fishing. It was, you know, both of them were immigrants. My grandfather was from Siberia. And so, you know, it's this memory of, yeah, that's how you did it. You just, you had food that you, you didn't have a fridge, a refrigerator then, you know, and you had to go and, and get the food. And so they very much lived like that. So they were not very spiritual people. You know, I was never raised with a religion. And, you know, in fact, I was raised like anti-religion. <laughs> but I think that, that is what allowed me to be able to explore spirituality versus having a religion over me. Yeah. And how did you find your way to spirituality if you were anti-religion? Was there a turning point that you remember a specific memory where you <laughs> decided to believe in something? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was this like, I, so I always wanted to be a writer. That was always my dream. I've been writing since I could hold a pen and I wrote short stories when I was a little kid and I you know, that lit me up. And so I, anyway, I had this plan to move to New York City and it fell through because I was like, I'm going to go be a writer. And it fell through because my friend decided not to go with me and I couldn't see myself going alone. So I ended up going to Boulder, Colorado of all places. It's like the opposite of New York City. And I met, I met my first teacher there and she gave me a healing. And I remember sitting on the banks of the Boulder River and she was giving me this healing and she said to me, you know, you, you have to learn how to go with the waves. You see how the, the, the river flows. You have to go learn to be like that river and not try to direct the river. And I was like, lady, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I, I couldn't understand it. But the strange thing was that I ended up um, spending two years of study with her probably and spent at least a month uh, living with her. Um, and it shook me because she was wild, you know, she was like a shamanic witch, you know, intuitive healer and taught me just how to let go of the mind because that was what was always getting in my way. And I find that it gets into a lot of people's way. So, yeah, I would say that absolutely. And I sort of knew, though, you know, I always have been very intuitive, very empathic. I think most people on this path are. 
and it's just a matter of the right person coming along and saying, hey, here's some tools to work with that. And what inspired you to either seek out this teacher or maybe the teacher found you? Oh, she totally found me. What it was, <laughs> was I was working at a domestic violence shelter at the time. And I, I, met, uh, I met someone who we would later go on to date for a long time. And it was her teacher. So it was like my like girlfriend had been studying with her and then she introduced me to this teacher and I was like, I, I would have never chosen that. I don't like, <laughs> I mean, the stuff that she, <laughs> that she put me through and it's like, it's the initiation, right? It's like, it's, yeah. you would never go through it again, but you're so glad that you did. Um, so I definitely didn't, I mean, it was spirit. Absolutely. It was like, here, take it. This is the person who's going to, <laughs> to like lead you to the next place. Totally. I love that too, because it's always like, there's no logical reason sometimes when we fall into these places. It's like, there's no other way to describe it than something bigger than us that was guiding us along the way. I'm curious to know, when did you make the shift in knowing that this was going to be like your thing and you wanted to study it more? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. What what was that shift? Well, it's always been been a bit of a process. So I, I, after studying with that teacher, with Tamara, um, I went for another, I think about probably another two years where I did, I basically went to study with her teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, This was specifically in in learning intuitive healing. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for about two years. And then I I was doing the work, like I was actually offering healings for people and doing a lot of work, but it wasn't anywhere near paying the bills. And so I was confused. I didn't know what to do. You know, I was like, okay, spirit led me to this place, but I'm, you know, making $300 a month or something, you know, because I was charging nothing. I, nobody told me how to make a business out of it. Nobody, you know, I was 21 years old, you know, it's like not, uh, I wasn't set up for success at the time in, in doing spiritual work for a living. And so I ended up doing, cause I'm a writer. I ended up taking on some work, um, doing communications, doing copywriting. And that led me, like, I do have a passion for social justice. Uh, Like I said, I was working in the domestic violence shelter. And I ended up working for doing nonprofit communications for a number of years, also doing readings and healings on the side. (laughs) So I was always this, you know, like, I couldn't tell people because they would, like, literally, I was in a meeting and I was like, oh, I'm an intuitive. And people literally moved their chairs away from me. (laughs) <laughs> oh that's crazy because they, I think it was part of, a, part of a like kind of a joke but it's still that's the mentality right it's it's either you believe in this stuff or you don't and my life has shown me I, continuously that uh, the gray space is where all the juice is definitely I I love to hear more about what were the tenets that you learned to become an intuitive healer so this is, um, it was the lineage. I didn't study through the Berkeley Psychic Institute, but it was a lineage through them. Um, there was a guy, Louis Bostwick, who started the Berkeley Psychic Institute, and then he trained a bunch of people. And I studied with people who were direct students of his, but they had since branched off and done their own thing. Um, it's essentially, you know, now that I've, I've done so much study of yoga, like I, I've gone really deep into, you know, understanding the chakras and, and things like that. Like I see how it was taking like really old traditional wisdom and merging it with new age stuff. Mm. Uh, but it worked. That This is the funny thing about it. I think there's a point where you just, you just get, um, if you're really hungry for this stuff, you have to go deeper. Um, like I, I, I was like, this is amazing. Cause I, you know, I learned how to take empathy and my natural intuitive nature and turn it into an ability to actually, it's like weightlifting, right? You have to train it. Everyone has this ability and some people just have a little bit more openness to it in the beginning of their life. Um, but everyone can do it. And it's, you know, it's essentially, you know, you have to practice at it. You have to learn how to trust yourself. That's what, that was the major part of the teaching. Trust yourself. Do you see this? Don't look for external validation. Yeah, I love that. And how did you find your way from doing the intuitive work and then you were kind of doing it on the side, but eventually into a place where you were practicing yoga. And then now what we know is getting into Ayurveda and doing stuff in that realm. Well, it was all, um, again, spirit kind of 
sent me to the right place, you know? So I, let's see, I've been doing, I, I lived in New York. And so for me, I started doing yoga, like studio yoga, you know, and it was a lifesaver, you know, just, just having a place to breathe. I actually would volunteer my time at a yoga studio in Brooklyn um, near my house, just so I could get free classes. Cause that was the only way I could do, you know, five or six classes a week. And it, it transformed me just to breathe transform me just to breathe. And so I became really devoted to just a physical yoga practice and asana practice. And I, that was like, I don't even know what 2001, 2000. No, I don't even know. My life is, is <laughs> this past couple of years has felt very long, but at any rate, um, it's been a long time. It's been a long time since I've been doing physical asana. And then what happened was um, I met my husband, my now husband, and we were both working in this nonprofit world, uh, doing policy work. And we were both kind of like the people that everyone, <laughs> you know, like you had to keep it quiet, like the ones who were scooting their chairs away, like we were both those kind of people. And so we um, just started to talk about this stuff and, you know, realized that we both had a really deep passion for it. Interestingly enough, his ex-girlfriend had introduced him to Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. My feeling with it, with, with it was at first I was totally... Um, turned off by Ayurveda because I'd done a dosha quiz in some women's magazine years ago. And it was so, it was just, it felt so restrictive. It was like, okay, here's this dosha quiz, you know, what shape is your nose? Um, you know, what, you know, that kind of thing, what color is your hair? Is it curly? And then therefore here's a list of foods that you can't eat. And, you know, of course, as you know, when you, <laughs> a lot of those foods are my favorite foods. They're like, don't eat spicy foods. It's like, you kidding me? I've got hot sauce in my, you know, <laughs> and everything on pizza. Um, so it eventually what happened is I, I started to work for uh, a teacher of Ayurveda and yoga. I started, it, it was like the writing piece again, that took me into, she needed a communications person. She needed someone to run her website and her social media. I took that job on. And I was apprenticing with her for four years, basically, as, as you know, I'd write these blogs for her and just interview her and learn about Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. And I did my yoga teacher training, my 200 hour through her. I did my, um, the health counselor, Ayurvedic health counselor program through her. And then since I've gone on and studied with other people. So it's a very winding path, but when I look at it from this perspective, I'm like, oh, that, I can see how that made sense. <laughs> I'd love to hear what are those, those first moments when you started to connect with Ayurveda and started to feel a transformation inside of you? Uh, what was that transformation like? Well, um, it had to do with getting pregnant. It had to do with getting pregnant because I'd heard that Ayurveda was very good with fertility and I had struggled. Um, I had recently broken up with, uh, had a divorce that was it dissolved because uh, the incredible tension around trying to get pregnant. And it was this light of hope. And then suddenly, I don't know what it was, but like, as soon as I started to read, you know, my now husband, when we were dating, he had just these books around his apartment and I would just pick them up and look at them. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of fun. And it started, it just kind of clicked with me, you know, and, and reading different authors outside of obviously a dosha quiz author. I have no idea who even wrote that. But like Vasant Lad, like reading some of his stuff, you know, and, and having um, David Frawley, like just these like books around that I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And because I've always been so drawn to food, it was a natural segue to say, oh, well, let me think about what I'm doing that uh, I could easily shift, like eating, you know, microwave leftovers for lunch, you know, or not chewing. And is, so I started to see really, really significant changes right away with doing really small things. And I ended up about, I don't know, about a year and a half later getting pregnant very easily. <laughs> no problems. Like it, it, it's, she's a super healthy little kid. You know, it's, I could not believe how easy it was. That's amazing that you went from um, first dosha quiz that really turned you off into giving it a second chance into the place that we now know you are, which is really having that deep contemplation of the doshas and the energies and the qualities that we use in Ayurveda. So 
I'd love for you to share more on what it means to contemplate Ayurveda and the different doshas and how that actually works when you apply it to things and use Ayurveda in a little bit more of this divine feminine way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a lovely question. It's something that I think we as Westerners tend to go very black and white. We tend to want things to either be this or that. We don't want this fluid space in between, which is the space of the divine feminine. You know, the divine feminine is constantly moving. She can be chaotic. She can be um, very disruptive <laughs> to a linear point of view on things. So, um, you know, I, I right now the primary study that I do of Ayurveda is with uh, Pranarnava or Vajragram in, in India. And, and Dr. Ramkumar was on a lecture, obviously this is all over Zoom, and said something that blew my mind, you know, because there was a doctor who had come on and was talking about, uh, you know, here's what you should and shouldn't do. And he kind of interrupted and said, you know what? We have to remember, this is, he's the head of the clinic, this is a Panchakarma clinic in, in India. Hey, we have to remember that it's everything is meant to be contemplated. This stuff is not just black and white. And it's, it was like, this is the language that, that is missing in so much of Western understanding of Ayurveda, is that it is not, it is, we're not supposed to understand it <laughs> right away. We're supposed to be, like me with the dosha quiz, my mentality, I was very intellectual, very mental. And my mentality was like, I don't want to stop eating hot sauce. So and it, rather than it had, it had I had a teacher uh, say to me, you know, it's actually your mind that's getting in the way. Your mind wants the hot sauce. Your body can live without it. And I'm a testament to that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's we just could all benefit from bringing in some more uh, softness in understanding of these things, meditating on the doshas. The doshas are, they're subtle energy. This is not, you know, this is not necessarily just, it doesn't start at like the shape of my nose or the, length of the you know, curly hair or straight hair. It doesn't start there. It starts at a much more subtle level, which requires some unpacking. Definitely. I think what's so interesting is that, you know, the ancient rishis who channeled this beautiful science, it's been around for over 5,000 years and it's meant to be dynamic by nature. That's always what one of my teachers from India said The whether it's yoga or Ayurveda, it's dynamic by nature. So if we have these like cold, hard rules, there's no way that that would be, and they're so specific in the way, like you can't eat this or eat that. Like that's not what the science is supposed to be. That's a restricted view. And that might be your truth through your validation through your own experience. But I love that you said, make it contemplative because it should be a conversation. It should be first tested in your own body. Like otherwise, you know, that's what science is. Like you're just validating it from like a secondhand source. You never get to really try it and see how it feels in your body. So yeah, we believe in that so much of like, okay, pulling from Ayurveda and constantly questioning what is that core of it? And like, what am I, you know, even putting my own conditionings on the science in itself? Because we often think that we have to be put in boxes and that we're just the same dosha constitution and uh, yeah, following those ways our whole lives when that's really not the truth of it. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we put our own conditioning on it. And what I have seen is that Ayurveda draws perfectionists to mm. it and specifically Definitely. perfectionist women. Yeah. And so then they put, like, I have seen more women treated as an eating disorder than, you know, I can name. It's, it's terrifying. Like, it's basically turned into this list of like, well, now I can't ever enjoy a meal with a friend because mm. they won't cook Ayurvedically. Mm. My, you know, my teacher, my current, um, I have many teachers, but I have one that I call my teacher, Shanti Devi. Any, anyway, so she always had, she tells me this story of, um, she didn't eat meat for a long time. I'm not sure if she is. She kind of goes on and off nowadays, but she wasn't eating meat. She was um, doing a plant-based diet and she came to a friend's house and he had cooked, uh, a friend uh, had cooked this meal that was, um, it was meat, it was pork. But it was this meal that his, his, you know, had been in his family. He was Mexican, and it was like this this way of cooking pork shoulder, and 
it was like this, he'd stayed up all night doing it and he put so much love and it had been passed down through his family and she ate it. And the friends that she was with said, are you actually going to eat that food? You're eating meat? And she's like, this is blessed food. This is prasad. You can't ignore that. You can't ignore that. I'm not saying you should eat whatever's put in front of you all the time, but I'm saying that we can be a little bit more gentle with it and welcoming in different kinds of experiences. And that helps to untie us from the perfectionism that's very, very uh, drying. Yeah, your that story speaks to me a lot. Um, my history is in disordered eating. I think that's how I came to Ayurveda as well. And there were things going off my body that I couldn't understand. And I was basically trying to like outsmart my body by restricting one thing and then it became two things and then eventually a lot of things. And Ayurveda was actually um, the key into stopping that pattern. So it was really magical in that way for me, but it took a lot of consciousness to be able to do that and support from Angelica, who was my first practitioner. But I think it, it is easy to apply our mindset to the Ayurvedic rules, especially when it comes to the physical body, because a lot of people, when they come to the science, don't understand that although it sounds good, like, oh, mind, body, spirit. Okay. It makes sense, but they don't truly understand. Like, what does that look like from the understanding of being healthy in mind, body, and spirit? Right. And so it, it took a long time, even for me while studying Ayurveda to figure out that just because the diet was perfect, there could be a lot of other things happening up here, happening on the emotional level and on the spiritual level that were still driving a lot of unhealthy habits. And so I'm curious for you, what was your experience like being a foodie and being in the body and intuitive healer and then coming to kind of the rules and guidelines of Ayurveda? And how did you work with that? And how did you get to the place where now you're able to teach it from the other, the other side of that bridge of no, having that knowing? Yeah, well, I got very rigid at first. You know, I, I, I work with a lot of perfectionists. It's sort of my specialty because I have a history of perfectionism. <laughs> so I got very rigid. I got freaked out. I, you know, this whole thing of like, you know, I had my daughter, um, I was pregnant and, you know, like this blissful pregnancy. And then it was like, what do I do if my daughter hasn't pooped in a day? You know, and, and this was the time period when I'm transitioning her from breast milk to solid food. And it's like, oh, that's normal. I found out later because it's, you're like literally moving from a liquid <laughs> substance to something solid. It's going to cause some di dis disruption, you know, but so having my moments of freaking out, being really rigid, I moved to Mexico. Okay. There are very few rules in Mexico. Everything is, is sort of a suggestion, you know? <laughs> and so we had, uh, I moved to a town that had a Panchakarma clinic and there was a lovely community of people who, who offered Panchakarma, a really wonderful place. And unfortunately since it has shut down, but um, the, I remember going out one night and I hadn't, I hadn't gone out at, in the evening hours in years. And I'm, I'm also just naturally an early riser. I've always been that way, but like it'd been years. And so my friend said, there's this, there's this music, uh, like one tiny, it's a little tiny town. There was like one venue and it had this great musicians coming through there. And so they said, come out and they're doing panchakarma and the girls, the women who are doing the panchakarma, they're the technicians are there and they're enjoying their evening and they're drinking mezcal. And, you know, I was like talking to one of them and she was, and I was like, how do you do this? Like, how do you, how do you have this world where on one hand you're offering panchakarma, but then you're also enjoying mezcal and like a, a really late night. I mean, for me, it's like midnight. I think I got home, you know, <laughs> it's like nowhere near late for some people. And she looked at me and she said, you know, there are some night days where it's kitchery. And then there are some days where it's mezcal and music. Mm. And it spoke to me. It was like, this is just, there is an ability to move. And when you have gone through, I'm, I, I do think there needs to be an, an initiation process where you have to release, you know, um, you have to release the things, the vices that, that held you down. And then you can recognize your mind's attachment to them. Mm. So I do think that we all go through that rigidity in the beginning. I think it's normal, but I don't think we should stay there. Yeah, that really speaks to me because I feel like one of the main purposes of really anything that you put into place to make yourself healthier so that you can go out in the world and live and thrive. And if you are cutting yourself off from that, then it's just going to show up in 
addictions to other things. Maybe it's food, maybe it's workouts, whatever it is. But I totally agree with your sentiment that for most people, and we see this in the clients that we see, it's like, get really strict. You start to understand the rules. You're very much embodying everything. And then I always picture they're like training wheels that come off the bike. And then you can start to have the freedom that comes with riding your bike fast and trying out the hills and the jumps and all of that. And so I just love the way you put words to that. Like some days are mezcal and, <laughs> and dancing and music. So that's just, yeah, that's what it's for. So we can live well in these bodies and then go out into the world and, and live well and feel well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What are some common threads you have noticed with the woman that you see um, and their relationship with their body? Oh, wow. Common threads. Um, believing that it's going to be fixed right away. That's, that's mm -hmm. probably the number one thing that I see that, you know, oh, I, I've been, you know, doing all of these things, quote unquote, right. And so therefore I should be healed already, not accounting for the fact that they have, you know, 30 something years of imbalance to make up. Um, so it's a perfectionism that shows up that way for sure. You know, it's this idea of, of my body. I, I just, I said to it one time, do something in a different way and the body should listen, you know, and it's much like training a puppy or if you have kids, it's like working with kids, like discipline with them training, you know, kids, your body or a dog. It's like, it's a long game. This is not about a short term stuff. You're going to get short term benefits. Absolutely. But it's a long game. And there will be fluctuations in that game. And, you know, I, I loved Rachel. I loved your, your bike analogy. I think that's, that's wonderful. It's exactly what it is. And then sometimes you're going to fall off your bike because you, you took too big of a risk. And therefore what you know how to do now is you know how to get back on the bike. So yeah. other, sorry, I can, I can share others if it's helpful. But yeah, no, please do. I um, would love to hear more. Yeah. Um, Body image is another one, like big stuff with body image. Um, people think that, uh, well, one of the things that's wonderful about Ayurveda is learning about the doshas for the first time. So if you learn, okay, so if I've always had a curvy body my whole life, and I've always lived in, a, and I live in the time period where curvy is, well, it's getting more accepted. But when I was an adolescent, curvy was not popular. People didn't talk about, you know, booties and whatnot. Like it wasn't a thing. Like to have hips was like, no, you you wanted to look like the supermodel, like very thin. You want to look like a boy. So this is a um, learning about the doshas opens up such a beautiful understanding of. Uh, for many of the women I work with, it's like, okay, well, oh, this is just my body. Okay, so I happen to be very, very thin. That's just my body. I happen to have curves. That's just my body. This is the makeup of the elements within my body that do that. I have a tremendous amount of strength, you know, and it's, we end up finding different things that really do tell the narrative about our body when we begin to contemplate the doshas. Yeah, I love that so much because I think that even sometimes we can have our own conditionings on like the doshas and the body types. I noticed that when I was studying at my college, we went to the internship and it's it like brought up a lot and there was a lot of unspokenness because I think it was still newer to like bring these two concepts together. But, you know, like n I know a lot of women felt like they didn't want to be labeled as kappa in in the class because they don't want to be and like I've heard that from my clients before like I don't want to be the you know insert unnecessary comment about being a kappa person or kappa nature and yeah I think that's like a whole nother world to like unpack too so how do you guide your clients through that when they have that own stereotype of like what a kappa body is yeah yeah well there's a lot of fat shaming in general you know there's a lot of and and you know it's not to say like the, the beautiful thing about kappa is not so much like <laughs> the beautiful thing is that is, is it's like all of the good values, all of the good traits in a personality that we, we know of compassion, love, um, tenderness. Those are all present in kappa very strongly, you know, like the, <laughs> it's, it's, so we have to be willing to see that like the nurturing aspect, which we are all in need of. And I often like to, when I work with clients, put them in the context outside of their individual experience, put them in the context of the cultural understanding. So if you were to look at the Victorian times, for instance, 
there were ads that would say, feed your daughter a stick of butter a day because they wanted her to get plump. That was, I mean, that was why they wore the clothing like that, you know, the big bustles on their skirts. So we have to remember this is temporary. This fixation on thinness is temporary. And it is right now shifting. I mean, Jennifer Lopez, I remember when she came out in like, what was that, 90, close, I guess it would have been close, I don't even know, like close to two, like 90, 98, somewhere around there, right? And she came on the scene and everyone was like, oh my God, she has a big booty. And it's, think about the shift in the culture mm-hmm. since that time frame, where now people are actually getting implants <laughs> to get a butt like hers. Whereas before they were like shaving it off. <laughs> so things are shifting, they're shifting before our very eyes. So I like to contextualize it for people. And so that it's not just about the individual experience. It's not about you and your own mind and your own echo chamber. It's let's place you in the historical cultural context in which you are currently standing. Yeah, I love that perspective because it really does root you in like, look how far we've come. And also to know like that same concept of like always wanting something that's like outside of ourselves and like without our reach. I think that comes back to that perfectionist tendency and like you can come back to that thread and see like how that is being projected in all different areas of their life, like not just their body image, which is so helpful as a coach. Yeah. 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 And I mean, one of the things that, that we learn is, you know, just to be our own points of self-reference mm-hmm. and to be able to just say, this is who I am. This is oddly the body I have. I don't know why I have this body. It has these quirks to it and these benefits, but this is who I am. We can stand in that, but not be fully attached to it you know, have the willingness to see it shift, have the, have the, you know, uh, after you have a kid, it's your body changes. It just does. There's no, you know, I don't have the same body I did, you know, and I've only had one kid. (laughs) People have a lot of attachment to their constructs, largely their mental constructs of who they are. We need to just claim them and just know them. Like this is, this is a story that you're telling yourself. This is nothing else but that it's a narrative and the narratives are temporary always. I love the way you talk about the stories and I'm interested to hear your perspective on telling yourself positive stories. Cause one of the things I think is been a really powerful practice for me is, and I know this is kind of cliche to say, but like self-love. And I feel like Ayurveda has really helped me do that where like, loving myself enough to make choices that are maybe inconvenient or uncool or difficult or out there. And part of that had to come with rewiring some of the beliefs and thoughts I had about how to do things like lose weight instead of it being this thing that I had to shame my body into. It was like, how can I create the most nurturing environment for my body to feel healthy? And then by the way, the byproduct of that was losing that weight. But how do you start to shift those narratives if you feel like you're so far from a place where that could even be true to you to start saying positive things or choosing love and nourishment over something else? Yeah, great question. Um, You know, I don't believe in lying to yourself. That's the first thing I'll say. I don't use affirmations. I don't advocate for people using them. Like the only affirmation I will, I will use is like, you are literally going to affirm what is present in this moment. Um, but I do believe in the power of pleasure. We are so wired to just go for the thing that is like, like we are going to biologically speaking, neurologically speaking, we look for the danger. And especially so with women, because our, biology is also in, trained to protect the, the offspring, even if we have them or not, right? So we look for that thing that is danger. We look for the thing that is, is and then we attach. <laughs> so we have an experience that is negative. And then we, we fixate on that and we say, this will always be the way that it, like this kind of circumstance will lead to a negative outcome. And then we avoid, uh, we, we, miss the opportunity to create pleasurable pathways in our minds. You know, this is like the idea of neuroplasticity. Like this is what it is. It's like, if you can retrain your mind, this is, I mean, yoga has been talking about neuroplasticity for (laughs) thousands of years. I love that science. It's like, oh, there's this thing called neuroplasticity. I was like, this is like, read the yoga text and this is what it talks about. (laughs) So to 
be in a moment where something feels painful or dreadful. So COVID, you know, we're all experiencing this, this tremendous pain right now. And it is so important at the same time to feel the pain as to also look for the things that are shifting in and bring us pleasure. So is it bringing us more pleasure to work from home? Yeah, absolutely. Nobody wants to go back to work in an office. Is it bringing us more pleasure to be able to um, be closer to our families? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> what can we do? It's, it's like there's so many opportunities in the worst moments of our lives to experience pleasure. When we do that, we have that memory. So the COVID memory, my hope for everyone is that they can remember some really powerful things. This is a time of incredible awakening. I mean, we're, we're seeing people questioning, you know, getting into spiritual, any kind of spirituality, you know, into Ayurveda, into the deeper teachings of yoga, into like the divine feminine, into the divine masculine, into witchcraft, like whatever it is, like people are getting into this stuff because this chasm has been created by, um, by the virus, right? And so we end up, so the opportunity in it is to find something that is bringing us true joy. I'm not talking about quick hits of pleasure. I'm talking about pausing and just noticing what are you really receiving in this moment? It is not all negative, I promise. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious if there's like some go-tos that you look for because it, it feels a little bit different than a gratitude practice because it seems like you're still looking for the good things, but how do you define pleasure? Is it truly just something you can be grateful for? Or is it something deeper than that? Gratitude is absolutely a part of it, but I think sometimes gratitude can cover up um, some of what's going on. You know, it can cover up, like you can just say, you know, my friend had a... Um, house fire and she calls me and she's like oh, her neighbor's house caught on fire and then it ended up catching her house on fire and it destroyed part of her kitchen and you know very very minor relative to what he went through and she's devastated she's in a hotel room with her kids and it's like this whole really difficult time for her and what her response was was like well but I didn't get like my at least my house didn't burn down at least no one died and I was like are you kidding me you're just completely bypassing all of the feelings that you have, this pain that you're having right now, like just, just be in that pain. It may not be the same pain that your neighbor in, is in because he lost his house. It's still valid. But my go-to is with pleasure to answer your question. I always, I always love to answer all of the questions. Pleasure is largely, well, we have to slow down. We have to get into the body. So this is where, you know, embodiment, you know, Ayurveda is wonderful for helping us, um, you know, if we're eating food that is highly processed, we are physically going to feel more numb. If we're taking a lot of, uh, like, you know, there's a time and a place for prescription drugs, right? But it's, it's, if you're taking a lot of that stuff before you try to address it with some other, um, you know, diet and, and herbs and things like that with support from a practitioner, obviously, then your, um, I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, you might have to edit that part out. I can try to. No worries. Um, okay, so yeah, you know, it's basically, if you're, okay, I'm just going to start again. No, yeah. yeah, yeah, we were talking about pleasure, kind of your go-to way to, to get into that and how it's different from gratitude. That's right. Getting into the body. Okay. So Ayurveda shows us how to get into the body. It shows us what kind of foods will help us get, become more friendly with our body. That's the first step. And then, you know, there's a lot of breath. Like I do pranayama every morning and it is so critical to my mental health. And to also just being able to feel like, like the, the, the prana of my body and feel where it, it moves and feel where it's stuck. That is for me, the most pleasurable act is just feeling my breath, feeling the moment, but also I'll say pausing. Pausing is a huge, huge pleasure generator. When we rush from one thing to the next without having a little bit of a moment, 
to just breathe and notice. We miss the chance to really collect that stuff that is pleasurable. So if we're rushing through cooking lunch, do we, do we miss out on the smell of the food cooking or the, the feeling of um, you know, chopping on your hands, the sound of the, the, the spices popping, the mustard seeds popping in your, in your pan? All of those things, like the senses are meant to be something that brings us joy. We just often misuse them <laughs> and we attach the senses become attached to this thing that like, it becomes like a fix rather than it being a full experience that you know going into it is temporary. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, I'll repeat this back to you and see if I got it right. But gratitude feels like something where we're kind of pulling the good, maybe in memories or using the mind. And it feels like the way you're describing pleasure is what you're feeling in the body. So what's, what's happening through the senses? What emotions are you feeling and pulling the good out of that, like sucking the nectar out of that? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think gratitude is important, but I think that pleasure, you know, when I, when I think of when I need pleasure, I, I dance. That's what I do. You know, mm -hmm. I, I put on my headphones I, in the morning and I just dance before my daughter's awake. You know, that brings me pleasure. Taking a walk that brings me pleasure. Yeah, I love that. Because I think that, you know, everyone has to have their own practice of presence in their own way. And I think that gratitude works for some because it pulls them in the presence. They're like, okay, what in my life right now can I be like really appreciative of? But I love that you said like pleasure is always accessible to us too. And like what, and there's so much, such a huge range of pleasures too, that it pulls us back into that present moment as well. So it's, it's so fun that we can find all these different ways to bring embodiment so it feels really true for us. Cause I've definitely been in the place before where I just was like so um, masculine about my gratitude practice. I couldn't go a day without it. And then it turned into a thing where like, you know what, I'm not in a place where I'm happy right now and I'm just pretending like I am. And I'm just like scraping the bottom end of the barrel to think of like anything I'm grateful for. And that's the exact opposite of how I'm feeling right now. And like that in itself is is not healing too. So yeah, it's it's, I, I feel that when you were saying that as well, it's being really present um, with whatever emotions that you're feeling in that, in that time. I mean, I can be in a state of devastation and still feel pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mainly it's that I feel pleasure for not feeling numb, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to claim that whole range of human emotion. If we want to have the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And this is kind of taking things in a new direction, but I'm interested with all of this work that you do in the body and emotionally, like how you see these things mirrored in your business and your work, because through Angelicanized experience, whatever we're doing, as far as working on ourselves and how good we feel, we often see that quickly reflected and, and soulful and the work that we put out and the clients we attract in. So do you find that that's also true for you? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. People, um, I think every teacher is working on themselves. <laughs> and if we're doing the work right, that, like, I'll, I'll be working on someone. I noticed this really in the beginning of, of doing healing work for people and just would, would see somebody who comes in and I would read that they initially have this issue with their mother. And at the time I was having a lot of issues with my mother. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the, the trick, the, one of the great things that I learned from the, uh, my training as an intuitive healer is that we do attract people that reflect to us where we need to work. Ideally, the teacher is a few steps ahead. So that's the key difference is that, you know, we don't, um, like we are self-aware enough to know what some of our pitfalls are and we're working on them. We're actively working on them. I think that's an important thing to share too, when you say a few steps ahead, because we have a community of a lot of people who are actually studying some of these things and maybe want to make shifts in their careers, but they maybe follow people like the Vasant Lads or the Dr. David Frawley's and they're like, uh, that, that's so far from where I could see myself and I don't have that level of expertise. How do I even get started? And so I think that, that that teaching or that nugget there is important is that you attract people who are 
maybe just right here in your journey and you're over here and that's perfect because you can have a lot of empathy for what they're going through. And it can also be the reminder for you to kind of break free of whatever habit or pattern is showing up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, we're never done. And I, I'm always, I'm always wary of a person who is a teacher who doesn't have a teacher. I'm always wary of that person who says, I, and I've, I've met them, I've met them. And that person is a person who believes that they are done, they are finished. And what I've known about healing is that there is no finish line. There is no finish line. There's just another mountain behind that mountain once you get up to the top. And so we, we have to be willing. I mean, I, I guarantee you that, you know, I don't know David Frawley or Asant Lad personally, but I guarantee you that they have someone that they look to for guidance. We all need that no matter where we are in our journey, whether it's at some point, you know, you would develop a community of people around you. It doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it's ideal if it's a teacher student, but there, I, I, you know, I think I've seen people who have had a lot of value from sharing things with community because the, frankly, you know, everyone's a teacher to us. You know, it's just, it's sometimes nice to have that clearly delineated. Yeah. And I guess kind of, um, in that vein, like, I, I feel like a lot of people are getting into this place now and it's this fine line between like having the teacher and also starting to trust yourself again and using the body wisdom and figuring out what's true for you. So having the teacher learning from them, of course, valuing their experience, but then also running that for yourself and deciding what's true for me and what's not, because it's being able to think for yourself and having that person, but also knowing how is it that you're going to share this? What is true for you? What have you actually experienced in yourself? And so um, what is your process like for putting things through the body and using your own intuition in your teachings? Yeah, well, um, that's a really, a really important topic to cover. It's a really important topic is, is you know, Ayurveda and yoga both teach direct experience is the best teacher. In fact, a lot of the texts will contradict each other. It's, it's hilarious to actually read it. And actually, um, there are points in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, it actually contradicts itself in the same text. So it's like, this is, it's not meant to be taken as the word of, I mean, it is kind of the word of like the divine, but it's not, you know, it's written by people. It's written by people. Teachers are people as well. I, um, I had the lovely opportunity of, of uh, studying under an incredibly controlling, um, some might say abusive teacher for a number of years. And one of the things I took away from that was that I am never again going to, and this is where I got very rigid, right? So I got very rigid under her teaching. And I am never again going to be in a position where I don't check in with myself. And because I watched many, 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 many of her students fall into this pitfall of saying, what would this person do? What would this person do with my life? But our life, <laughs> my life, like my teacher right now, I am full. I, I love her. I, I adore her, her guidance for me. But I also, there's times where I'm like, that's not right for me. That's not right for me. That's, that's an experience that you've had. And I appreciate that. But there's a million different ways to have a life. So we have to be willing, and I think this sometimes comes um, the hard way. You know, we don't really learn too well the easy way. <laughs> so we have to learn it the hard way and then say, never again, this is a new boundary. You will never cross it again. Mm -hmm. But if I, I'll say this for, for your listeners. If something makes you feel, if a teacher says something and it makes you feel ashamed of yourself, Mm -hmm. ask yourself if that is really you or if that's the teacher's projection because mm -hmm. this stuff should never bring you shame we should never feel shame in asking a question even if it's a very basic simple question so it's it's it may not be you if you feel that kind of shame or or you know dismissal of your truth of of the truth that you have of the experience that you've had Yeah, I, I love that. I think I often ask myself, because I wrestle with my own inner critic voice a lot, 
Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that probably came from teachers who are really dogmatic. And, yeah. you know, I grew up Christian Catholic, so I grew up in a very religious, restricted way. So I have to unpack that a lot. But I asked myself, what feels like freedom to me in this moment? And sometimes, like if I'm talking about the scope of food, sometimes that is choosing dessert and it's really yummy and it feels like free that I get to do that. And other times it feels literally more free not to and just to feel like how empowered I am to not have it. And that's just like a really simple, basic way of thinking about it. But um, I think that goes hand in hand with that of really seeing like, where do I feel empowered here? And, and is this someone taking away my power is, is just huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a very good relationship with authority in the West. Mm -hmm. That's what I've, I've found. And like, we either bow down to them or we just rebel for no reason. <laughs> so it kind of, you know, it depends on the leader, it depends on the person, but you know, it's, it's, we don't know what it means to allow someone to be very influential. Like I, I mentioned this teacher who, who was very um, problematic, very difficult, very abusive. And I will also credit her with teaching me extremely, like the fundamental stuff that I use every day was because of her. I saw though, in my, my very first teacher too, Tamara, the one I mentioned who, who gave me that reading by the, um, the river, very problematic person, <laughs> very difficult, far too difficult for me. And it, both teachers, it was me saying, this person is hurting me as, as much as she is helping me, but I don't want that. I want someone who may, I might have conflict, conflict is good, Conflict is very healthy. We, we resolve things. We develop intimacy through conflict. But it should not be a conflict that eats me up inside. Yeah, I, I think that's so powerful. And I think something that a lot of us need to hear, I think it's a topic a lot of us actually don't talk about enough either, is understanding how to tap back into that inner authority and intuition in those situations. And you know, giving people permission to stand up for what feels right for them in those moments, because it's going to feel different what each person's true north or right is. And so um, just thank you for, for sharing your story and your experiences with both of those teachers. Yeah. And I think that's a really powerful place to lead this conversation. And I would love for you to share with all of our listeners where they can work with you, where they can find you online and yeah, just get more from you. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So I work out of uh, my, my URL is savamama.com, S-E-V-A-M-A-M-A.com. And Save a Mama is my, um, my business that I work with for doing wisdom guidance. People can work with me. I have um, programs where people can work one-on-one -on -one with me. Uh, and in doing so, you join the nest, which is my secret. You get access to a secret blog um, and there's different levels of it. So you don't have to work one-on-one -on -one with me, but there's, you can get um, part, uh, you can join and get into a group um, gathering that I lead once a month, or you can just simply have access to the secret blog where I do all these different teachings and offer meditations and yoga nidra and various practices, um, recipes as well. I don't share my recipes publicly. I share them only on this secret blog called The Nest. So uh, you can find me there. You can also go to... Um, Oh, I'm, we had a special catchy URL for it. And I don't remember, but savamama.com. <laughs> You'll find the nest there. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have all of that linked in the show notes. And thank you just so much for sitting with us today and for sharing your stories and your wisdom. And it was such a good conversation. So we appreciate you being here. Oh, thank